Will and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film are solely those of Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast, or the station as a whole. I've got five new movies to review for you for this show, but first I'm going to get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? The Top 10 Highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, some are not, and I will be able to tell you the difference once I get things started here. So, number one at the box office is the, also the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, which is The Equalizer 2, starring Denzel Washington, which is, by the way, one of the four movies I'll be reviewing for you for the show. This weekend it grossed $36 million in the United States in all the countries in the world, including the United States, it grossed $39.1 million, and that's against a projected budget of $62 million. So, The Equalizer 2 is off to a pretty good start being number one. I doubt it will be number one by next week, but we'll, of course, have to see. But still, it's off to a pretty good start, but it's not hit yet here in the States or around the world yet. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, the sequel to the movie Mamma Mia, which is based on the Broadway musical, and the movie came out in 2008, its sequel came out in 2018, it seems like everybody in the cast has not aged a single day, but that's another story for another time. But the sequel to Mamma Mia grossed a pretty good $35 million, just $1 million less than The Equalizer 2. But against a budget of $75 million, it has so far grossed around the world $70 $7.9 million. So while it's not a hit yet here in the States, it is actually a tentative hit around the world. And it's <clears throat> actually kind of surprising how, how much more it grossed around the world than The Equalizer 2. But I don't know what that says about people around the world and what American movies they're more gravitated towards. But in any event... Hotel Transylvania 3, Summer Vacation, was number one at the box office last week. This week it slid to number three, having made $23.8 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $80 million, Hotel Transylvania 3 has so far made $91.7 million here in the States and $208.1 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but a certified hit around the world. Ant-Man and the Wasp is number four at the box office this weekend in its third week in release, down from number two last week. It was only able to be number one at the box office for one week, which is kind of unusual, but at the same time, I do have the feeling that Ant-Man and the Wasp may actually go up in the top ten rather than down, but of course, we'll have to see. This weekend, it made $16.5 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $162 million, Ant-Man and the Wasp has so far made $165 million here in the States, and $354.6 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States, and around the world, it is just a certified hit. Just barely, but it made it. Incredibles 2 is doing very well at the box office in its sixth week in release. This weekend it grossed $11.9 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $200 million, Incredibles 2 has so far grossed $557.7 million here in the States, and, if you can believe it, $941.5 million around the world. So it has made nearly a billion dollars around the world. And next week, it could reach that billion-dollar mark. But rest assured, it is another home run for the Walt Disney Company, and it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Very good for Incredibles 2 and very good for Disney Pixar, Pixar most especially. Skyscraper is number six at the box office, sliding a lot from number three last week, having grossed $11.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend, just a fraction less than Incredibles 2. Skyscraper, on a budget ranging from $125 to $129 million, is kind of struggling here in the States, but then again, it is its second, it is in its second week. It grossed 
$47.1 million here in the States, and $182.8 million worldwide. So very much like Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, Skyscraper is doing a lot better around the world than it is just in the States. Here in the States, it's not even close to a certified hit, or not even close to a hit of any kind, but around the world it is a tentative hit and should be certified probably by next week, if not sooner. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is in its fifth week in release and slid from number five last week to number seven this week, having grossed $11.3 million at the U.S. box office, but it's still doing really strong. Lee, against a budget ranging from $170 to $187 million, somewhere in that range, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom has so far grossed $384.2 million at the U.S. box office so far, and around the world it has grossed $1.1 Point one nine eight billion dollars. That is quite incredible, which makes it a certified hit here in the states and around the world. Although compared to the original Jurassic World, Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom, in terms of numbers it's grossed in the United States, does pale in comparison, which might put it at odds for another sequel, but. Of course, given its international numbers, there may be another Jurassic World movie sometime in the next three to four years. We'll have to see. The First Purge is doing decently for any movie, but doing incredibly well for a horror suspense thriller like it is. This weekend, it grossed $5.1 million at the U.S. box office, sliding from number six last week to number eight this week. Against a budget of $13 million, The First Purge has so far grossed $60.3 million here in the United States and $96.9 million around the world. So even though it isn't exactly breaking box office, office records. It still is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. It seems like horror movies, no matter how good or how bad, are a sure thing. And there's no better example of it than Unfriended Dark Web, which debuted at number nine, which is kind of weak. But against a budget of $1 million, it made $3.7 million this past weekend, automatically making it a certified hit. I don't have the international numbers for you, but if it's a certified hit here in the States, it is vicariously a certified hit around the world. And finally, number 10, Sorry to Bother You, fell from number 7 last week, having grossed $2.9 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. I don't have the international numbers for you, but against a budget of $3.2 million, Sorry to Bother You has so far grossed $10.3 million here in the States, making it a certified hit here in the States. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the Black Experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching Words on Film on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station somewhere in the country who is kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, as always, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page Page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is The Equalizer 2, which reunites Denzel Washington with director Antoine Fuqua for not only the second time in this series, The Equalizer, but also the fourth time as an actor and director pair. They first teamed up in 2001 with Training Day, which won Denzel Washington his first Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role. And actually, he was the first 
African American actor in. 38 years to win the Best Actor in a Leading Role Oscar, although Training Day was his second overall win. But Antoine Fuqua has been kind of hit or miss with his his movies. I, I don't think there's been any movies where he's... Uh, which have just been flat out awful, at least not yet. But whenever he pairs up with Denzel Washington, it's usually a good movie. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, Equalizer 2 is certainly no exception to that rule. So Equalizer 2 brings us back to Denzel Washington's character, Robert McCall, who works at, in in the first movie, The Equalizer from 2014, he worked in a Home Depot-like store. In The Equalizer 2, he somehow quit that job, I don't know exactly why, and now works as a Lyft driver. And what's interesting is that in the first movie, Denzel Washington's character, Robert McCall, worked in a Home Depot-like place that was called Home Mart, even though... the Home Mart doesn't exist, and that wasn't product placement. But in this movie, he works for Lyft. Not Uber, but Lyft. And the Lyft logo can be seen in various places. So I bet Home Depot is probably kicking kicking themselves for not allowing their product placement in the Equalizer, considering that how much of a big hit that was. But anyway, Robert McCall is working as a Lyft driver in Boston, where much of this film is not only takes place, but also was filmed, and he serves an unflinching justice for the exploited and oppressed. But how far will he go when that exploited and oppressed person is someone he loves? So you might remember from the first Equalizer movie that Denzel Washington was going after the Russian mob in in Boston, and particularly, although not exclusively, to save a young girl who was working as a call girl for the Russian mob, who is played by Chloe Grace Moretz. Chloe Grace Moretz is not in this second movie. I think her her chapter is complete. But Denzel Washington's character actually saves a number of other exploited and oppressed people. And I do like the fact that The Equalizer 2 does not copy the plot from the original. Of course, it might seem obvious that why would any movie copy the plot from the original, but more sequels do that than you think. And at first, when I heard that there was an actress from Maine who plays a young girl who was kidnapped by a Turkish man, I initially thought to myself, this is repeating the exact same plot from the original. But it turns out that's just the first subplot in the film, which gets resolved surprisingly quickly. And I only found out about that because of a news story about that young girl from Maine who plays the, the 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 girl who's kidnapped but in any event there are a number of people besides Denzel Washington who reprise their roles from the original including Bill Pullman and Melissa Leo who play counterparts of Denzel Washington's character who worked with him in the past but while they're still active in whatever Secret Service Agency, Robert McCall, Denzel Washington's character, had worked for previously. Bill Pullman and Melissa Leo still work with that service, whatever it is, and they don't exactly tell you or elaborate upon what previous training Robert McCall has. All you kind of know is that he has special ops training. He can fight better than probably about 95% of the people with whom he encounters in this movie, and he's hiding some sort of past, but he's doing it for a noble cause. So to say anything more about what Denzel Washington's mission is and what the turning point of this movie is will really spoil what happens here. All I can tell you is that someone close to Denzel Washington actually ends up getting killed and Denzel Washington's character is out to seek revenge for that killing while at the same time also trying to set someone who's more or less a stranger to him but somebody he knows in an acquaintance level on the right path. Turns out it's a young man who lives in his apartment building whose name is Miles Whitaker who's played by a fine young actor by the name of Ashton Sanders. Now, Miles Whitaker is a talented artist, but he also is embedded in gang life in his 
hometown. And Denzel Washington's character is trying to steer him clear of that. And that's certainly a noble cause. And Ashton Sanders does pretty well here as a guy who is well-meaning, but also uh, continually goes down the wrong path. There's also a very good supporting performance in this movie by Orson Bean, who usually doesn't play an obvious character. Orson Bean is a is a good actor, but I wouldn't exactly call him a character actor. But in this movie, he plays somebody who's who doesn't wear any makeup, but still from the character's background, he's very unrecognizable from the usual Orson Bean. So, Equalizer 2 is action-packed, just as the original Equalizer was, and I would probably recommend that you see the original Equalizer before going into the Equalizer 2. One thing I I actually didn't know until I actually left the theaters after seeing Equalizer 2 that it's actually based on a television series that aired briefly on CBS from 1985 to 1989. Even though I was alive in the 80s, I don't remember this TV series at all. But it is kind of cool that the Equalizer movies, very much like the Fugitive and the Mission Impossible movies, are creating a a more consistent cinematic universe that is not entirely dependent on the original show. So I'm running out of time here. The Equalizer 2 gets my rating of a knockout. It's got a lot of great action. Denzel Washington is great as Robert McCall as usual, and Antoine Fuqua directs very well. Imagine if I told you that an earthquake was going to hit tomorrow right where you live. That it would be 6.5 in magnitude with aftershocks occurring twice 25 minutes apart. You'd no doubt talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true. I can't tell you an earthquake will happen tomorrow. But what if it does? Shouldn't you have a plan? Visit lacounty.gov slash emergency and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m., bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Eighth Grade. This is a movie that was not in the top ten this week, but my God, I absolutely love this film. This is a film that debuted at Sundance this year, and I am kind of kicking myself for not getting into Sundance, but actually, in a couple of months, when they open up applications for press passes, I will apply for one. So maybe... Maybe, just maybe, I'll go to Sundance next year, but of course we'll have to see. But anyway, 8th Grade represents the directorial and screenplay debut of Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham may not be a familiar name to you guys, but about 10 years ago he actually hit it big as one of the first YouTube celebrities. And basically, when he was an unknown back then, he was a 17-year-old who used a keyboard and a a computer video camera to tape himself doing these very articulate rap songs, which it's, it's kind of surprising because it's, Bo Burnham did kind of blow up for a while there as a stand-up comic and made cameos in in movies like Funny People, directed by Judd Apatow. But ever since then, his his fame has kind of faltered. But I am kind of surprised, based on those early YouTube videos, that he didn't have an illustrious music career because I think he's a lot better than probably about ninety five to ninety eight percent of rappers who are hitting the charts right now. I wouldn't go as far as to say he's better than Drake, but he's certainly on par with them. But anyway, Bo Burnham wrote and directed this movie, which takes place in the eighth grade year of some poor young girl's life. This is a movie about an introverted early teenage girl who tries to survive the last week of her disastrous eighth grade year before leaving to start high school. The eighth grader in question here is a young girl around the age of 13 to 14. Whether or not she is that age in real life doesn't really matter, but her name is Kayla, and she's played by Elsie Fisher. 
And Elsie Fisher is a young actress who's not exactly a newcomer, but this is her debut as a lead actress. And judging from her performance in this movie, it's probably not going to be the last time we see her. But she's done actually an impressive amount of on screen and voice acting over the last couple of years. She's probably best known for being vo- the voice of the child. Agnes in the Despicable Me films, of which they've made three so far, I think. Maybe, yeah, yeah okay. I think they've probably made two, three of them, but she's in two of them. But I haven't seen, actually, any of the Despicable Me movies all the way through, but I did like the fact that 8th Grade didn't have any famous people in it. it. It certainly had a number of people who have had acting experience before, but no really familiar faces or names, but Elsie Fisher was really good in this film as not only an introverted early teen, but also an awkward one as well. And I thought one of the best parts of this movie was when you see her recording YouTube videos where she is giving advice to to kids and talking about basically a life that she wish she had but is not exactly her own. Let me explain that. What what I mean by that is she's pretending to be a popular kid who has everything together when she goes when you can actually see her in junior high and you realize her life is actually far from that. And there are so many relatable scenes in this movie. Mainly, my complaint about movies that take place in junior high and high school, particularly in junior high, is that they don't really delve into what's painful about those places. I I had a cataclysmic junior high experience, and before I seen the eighth grade, the only movie which really came close to the pain I felt during those years was probably Welcome to the Dollhouse. And there was even a movie about two years ago that came out based on the James Patterson books for kids, which were called middle school, the worst years of my life. And they made a movie out of that, which was pretty bad. It was bad, it was sugar-coated, and it bore a resemblance to nothing I experienced in junior high. And I, I even said during my review of that movie that if they were to make a junior high movie that was really accurate they would it would probably have to be r rated and eighth grade is rated r but i think it's rated r mostly for language there's really no sexual content in this movie other than some of the questionable youtube videos that that kayla watches in this film to get some uh, well <laughs> slight expertise in various subjects, but there are a couple of effort words that are dropped here. But overall, I do think that junior high kids now should see this film and adults will get a lot out of it too when welcome to the dollhouse came out in 1996 i remember i was about 13 so i was in junior high when that movie came out but reviewers were saying even though it is a movie that takes place in junior high kids in junior high should not watch this movie i absolutely disagree when it comes to this film because it is poignantly painful in several instances and in addition to the great acting job that Elsie Fisher does I was also really impressed by Josh Hamilton who plays Elsie Fisher's father who's, whose name is Mark and you, you don't really know until later in the movie how why it is that Kayla is raised by a single dad. You're, you're kind of wondering where her mom is in this instance, but what I could relate to was the, the relationship between the two of them. He's not exactly a strict dad. In fact, there are scenes where I've watched this and I thought to myself, he should probably be stricter. Like, tell her to put her cell phone away during dinner, for instance. That would be kind of a start. But it, it certainly was a very realistic interpretation of a father-daughter relationship, particularly when the girl is in junior high and still trying to find her a, a personality that's true to herself. And she certainly struggles with that, and I can certainly relate to this. So, great job to Elsie Fisher and Josh Hamilton for their stellar acting job in this movie. If it is not apparent to you, this movie gets my rating of a knockout. There are parts of the movie that are very, very painful to watch, but the only reason they are painful is because you've probably made some of these social mistakes when you were in junior high. I know 
I certainly did. And even though this depicts a junior high of present day where a lot of kids are buried in their cell phones, there are still some universal truths to this film that, that still ring true. But it also is a bit of a critical look at people who are buried in their cell phones all the time. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful Me Club. The Somerville Line, where adventures begin. Join us every other Tuesday evening from 8 to 10 p.m. Stories of inspiration, motivation, stories to help you accomplish your dream. Join us on the Somerville Line every other Tuesday evening from 8 to 10 p.m. on Somerville Community Access Television Station. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot, which is a movie that actually also debuted at Sundance. It's directed by Gus Van Sant and stars Joaquin Phoenix as the real-life paralyzed illustrator John Callahan. The movie is about how John Callahan got into creating cartoons tunes which highlighted his life as a paraplegic and it's also about his struggles with alcohol and john callahan by the way was a real cartoonist who just recently passed away comparatively recently in 2010 and this movie details the rocky the rocky path to sobriety after a life-changing accident and john callahan discovers the healing power of art willing his injured hands into drawing hilarious often controversial cartoons which brings him which bring him a new lease on life. So you have Joaquin Phoenix having a stellar leading performance here as John Callahan. And there are parts of this movie that are fun to watch. There are also other parts that are absolutely painful. Probably the most painful scenes are when Joaquin Phoenix as John Callahan is in the hospital after realizing he has been paralyzed from the mid-chest down as a result of a drunken car accident. He was drunk during the car accident, but he was actually not the one that was driving. Instead, there was a fellow acquaintance named Dexter who's played in this movie by Jack Black. And Jack Black, I gotta tell you, of course, he's he's really funny in most comedies he's in. Even when a comedy sucks, like Gulliver's Travels, I tend to get at least a couple of chuckles out of Jack Black. But he is really underrated as a dramatic actor. I thought he was one of the strengths of the movie King Kong, for instance. But here in this movie, there are scenes between Joaquin Phoenix and Jack Black which are really heartbreaking. And probably one of the most heartbreaking parts about this movie is are that... Dexter was driving drunk when John Callahan was in the passenger seat, but unlike John Callahan, this character Dexter, who might be a composite character, actually ended up surviving the car accident and, and got a few scratches on him at best. He was still able to to walk afterwards. So the fate that beset John Callahan is incredibly sad to watch. And even though, kind of like Born on the Fourth of July, you know this part of, is coming, it's really sad to see it happen nonetheless. There are also some other good supporting performances in this movie, including one by Rooney Mara, who plays this Swedish woman who consoles John Callahan after he's after he's injured, and her name is Anu. And one of my biggest complaints with Rooney Mara is that she is she's a decent actress, I think, in just about in most other movies I've seen her in, with perhaps the exception of The Social Network, I thought her performance was a little overrated. But And the reason for that was because I never thought Rooney Mara gave off convincing charisma, or even tried to give off charisma. But here, in her role as Anu, she's not only incredibly captivating, but she reflects charisma extremely well. Another actor in this movie I, I've always... 
who I've mostly considered overrated is Jonah Hill, who plays another recovering alcoholic named Donnie, who leads John Callahan's local chapter of Alcoholics Anonymous. And even though Jonah Hill has a co-starring role in this film... He's good. I wouldn't necessarily say he's great in this film, but Jonah Hill does a good, does a decent job portraying Donnie, and I can't say that I was disappointed in Jonah Hill's performance in this movie at all. It probably wasn't as good as his performances in movies like Superbad or Moneyball, but he was good in this film as well. And the movie start. I think the the first half of the movie is really good when you sort of get the 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 scope of John Callahan's alcoholism and even his traumatic accident which paralyzes him doesn't stop him from drinking excessively and that, and that's actually not only really sad but it also reflects the the pain of addiction and how even something traumatic that happens in your life doesn't stop you from seeking comfort from things from which you shouldn't seek comfort something that would damaged your life enough already and even addiction doesn't really follow that rule of always of if something really harms you you should stop doing it and i think the movie reflects that very well unfortunately the movie faltered as during the second half when it it i think it placed a little too much emphasis on the AA meetings and John Callahan's road to recovery. I'm not saying that the road to recovery wasn't important, but what I am saying is eventually the scenes where he's in an AA meeting drag considerably. There are certainly great moments in his AA meetings in the first half of the movie, but the second half feels a little redundant. And I think by that point, they should have focused a lot more on his artistic abilities and the the, the cartoons he draws that are similar to the the ones in the new yorker except these ones are actually kind of funny as a matter of fact the title of this movie don't worry he won't get far on foot is actually based on a cartoon he has with that caption which shows three guys on horseback presumably policemen in the old west who come across a wheelchair and it's a little stupid of me to describe this and expect you to think it's funny but it actually is kind of funny when you see it in the movie and maybe even on paper so it's not one of gus van sant's best movies of course it's hard to top some of his other movies like drugstore cowboy or goodwill hunting but this movie at least turns in good performances by joaquin phoenix rooney mara and jack black most especially as a matter of fact when joaquin phoenix actually confronts jack black's character after the accident and jack black's character is just working in a coffee shop or maybe it's a bar he's working in a bar actually and he's he's walking around he's doing fine but when he actually it talks with, it speaks with Joaquin Phoenix's character. It really is a moving scene. Other than that, though, the second half of the film didn't really leave me as interested as I anticipated I would be. So it gets my rating of a checkout. I do think, of course, these three performances that I mentioned are stellar, but the rest of the movie kind of dragged. It didn't really keep its narrative footing and even though it wasn't told linearly i i still, still think the linear home, editing was not a liability teams, learned about loans scoured neighborhoods and asked the right questions if you manage that you can get your retirement plan on track visiting aceyourretirement.org can help brought to you by aarp and the ad council you're listening to the best local tunes and talk around only on bostonfreeradio.com to buy your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. I love those real six signs. They're the ones that move me. Thinly blow, <laughs> new 
Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacker Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Table 19, which is a movie that came out last year. Its release date, according to IMDb, is March 3rd, 2017. But I don't actually remember this film out in theaters. I actually caught it this weekend when I was at home with my parents, and it was a Saturday night, and we were trying to decide what to watch on TV. And even though they have cable, there wasn't a lot on. So we went to the uh, our Amazon streaming service and found this film. It stars Anna Kendrick, and Anna Kendrick is, even when she's in a bad film, she's usually worth watching in a film. And I think this, this movie, Table 19, is certainly no exception. It's directed by Jeffrey Blitz, who is a, a director who has brought us a number of TV series. He directed one episode of Parks and Recreation, and he actually directed Anna Kendrick in one of her first movies, which was called Rocket Science, which is another one that was kind of big on the indie scene, but didn't really make a big splash in theaters. And he's also probably best known for directing the documentary Spellbound, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary Feature in 2003. So, Jeffrey Blitz is back with Anna Kendrick in this movie, Table 19, which is about a woman who is going to a wedding, despite the fact that her ex-boyfriend is actually not the groom. They uh, averted that kind of cliche. He is the best man. But the reason behind their breakup and the reason she shows up to the wedding are not entirely known until the movie progresses. So, what is significant about Table 19? Well, let me put it to you this way. During the reception in this movie, there are 19 tables. So, table 19 is kind of the lowest in rank. And it turns out there are a bunch of quirky characters that inhabit this table. And according to Anna Kendrick's character, whose name is Eloise, she's put at table 19 probably because of her breakup with the best man, but also because she was at one point a bridesmaid, but that ended probably because of this breakup. But there's a little bit more to the story. But anyway, the quirky number of characters who inhabit this alleged reject table include husband and wife Bina and Jerry Kep, who are played by Lisa Kudrow and Craig Robinson, who play uh, diner owners who are reluctantly going to this wedding. There's also a... <laughs> there's there's also an old woman who is actually the bride's first nanny, whose name is Joe Flanagan, who's played by June Squibb. There's also a, a very awkward teenager whose name is Renzo, who's played by the Grand Budapest Hotel's Tony Revolori. And last but not least, there is a tall, lanky British man who is... There for some odd reason. He knows the, the father of the groom, but is not in the best relationship with him. His name is Walter Thimble, and he's played by Stephen Merchant. But once you actually realize the backstory behind Walter Thimble and why he's at table 19, it kind of makes you wonder why he would be invited to the wedding in the first place, because it turns out he did something really, really bad to the family of the groom. What that is, I'm not going to reveal, but the, the the movie actually has some laughs. It certainly has a lot of painful and cringe-inducing moments, well-intentioned, of course, but there are some certain plot holes to the film. For instance, Table 19 is meant to be, you know, the, the reject table, the one where not the most significant or the most popular people are seated at this wedding. And at one point, Craig Robinson actually says that he can smell the bathrooms from, or smell the toilets from where he's sitting at the table, which isn't exactly appetizing, but he does say it. But at the same time, when Anna Kendrick gets up to leave to go to the bathroom, it seems like she walks a considerable distance to go to the bathroom. So it's that there's one plot hole there. Additionally, the character of Renzo is 
delightfully awkward, but at the same time, it's not really well established what relation he is to the bridal party, either the bride or the groom's family. It's not really established whether he's a, a family member or a friend. And it's also revealed that his mother he's a high school student first of all and you're not really that's not really revealed until a little too late into the movie but his mom makes him go to the wedding in place of his junior prom and his mom says that it's a great way for him to meet women and he's obviously socially awkward so that's a challenge for him but why would going to a wedding be a better place to meet women than junior prom uh, of course, you know, you you have women you see every day at, at junior prom, so that might be a liability, but people you don't know also attend junior prom from other schools as well, and it, it just seems like they're going to a wedding wouldn't be quite as significant as going to junior prom, but then again, I, I don't quite know. I did like Anna Kendrick in this movie. I, I thought she was good, as always. I also really like June Squibb as the as the first nanny to the bride who feels quite a bit underappreciated because of the fact that she's at such a faraway table and she's worried that and and she's actually under suspicion that the family just completely forgot about her which may or may not be correct but this this movie was relatively uneven i do actually credit it for sidestepping some wedding movie clichés particularly about guests who are invited but not exactly welcome I think that's a good way of putting it. And I thought it started out really well with Anna Kendrick checking off either the box that said, you know, will attend with pleasure or won't attend with regrets or accept with pleasure or decline with regrets. And she checks off one box and then tries to cross it off. And then she burns part of the invitation and sends it anyway. I think there were moments of brilliance in this film, but overall it was emotionally uneven and I didn't exactly like the way it ended either. So it gets my rating of a checkout because I think anything with Anna Kendrick is worth seeing because of Anna Kendrick herself. I think she's a wonderful actress and she does very well in whatever role she's in, regardless of the movie. But I just didn't really get into this film. I didn't really get into the characters. I didn't understand why some of them were there. And it's really the movie's responsibility to vouch for every character, which it really didn't in this case. Hoy es el día en que tu hijo empieza a gatear O leer sus primeras palabras La casa roja O cuando se dio cuenta que quiere ser ingeniera Dos X más Z O es hoy, cuando tienes un choque en tu auto Tu hijo está en el car seat equivocado y todo podría cambiar No arriesgues el futuro de tus hijos Asegúrate de tener el car seat correcto para su edad y tamaño Visita safercar.gov diagonal protegidos Un mensaje de la Administración Nacional de Seguridad del Tráfico en las Carreteras y el Ad Council This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and this is usually the part of the show where I review my fifth movie. But in that case, whenever I run out of movies to review, I usually give a little bit of movie news or a little bit of insight on movies that are coming out on DVD and or Blu-ray this, well, today, since it's Tuesday, July 24th. So there aren't actually very many movies, according to the website I'm looking at that are coming out today. But one of the most significant ones that's coming out today is Ready Player One, which I think is actually one of my favorite movies of the year so far. It it was a hit, but it wasn't in a special it didn't make an especially big splash at the box office. But I do think that very much like Blade Runner, Ready Player One is going to develop a bigger following on DVD and Blu-ray. In fact, I think this movie is definitely worth seeing on Blu-ray or the new 4K. I think this movie was practically made for 4K. And I I actually am looking forward to seeing it again. Not only seeing it again, but also reading the book. Because I did not read the book upon which it's based before seeing the movie. Which I try to do with most movies. But then again, I only have so much time to see a film. But Ready Player One is out, in th- or rather out on DVD, Blu-ray, and, and 4K right now. I'm not sure if if 4K is going to permanently release Blu-ray because I think movies still look pretty damn good on on Blu-ray, but anyway, for those of you who missed Ready Player 1, I kind of pity you, but no, I I don't really, but it looks great on the big screen. But it's a movie about the creator of a virtual reality world who co- that's called the Oasis, and when he dies, he releases a video in which he challenges all Oasis users to find his Easter egg, which will give the finder his fortune. So it's part Blade Runner, it's part Lawnmower Man 2, it's part Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and in addition to that, there are a number of cool Easter eggs, not just the ones that the the lead actor in this movie, Ty, Ty Sheridan, is slated to find, but also a number of great pop culture nods and references in this movie. When Before this movie came out, I expected this movie to be kind of the movie to end all movies, but my God, if, that was, if this was the movie to end all movies, there's no point in me being a film critic. But a lot of great performances in this movie. I liked Ty Sheridan as the lead, Olivia Cook as his co-conspirator and also love interest. Uh, she was good too. I also really liked uh, Mark Rylance as the as the architect of the Oasis. And I have the feeling in ten to twenty years there will be an Oasis. Um, I also really liked one of the villains in this movie, uh, ha- Hannah John Common, who was recently in the movie Ant Man and the Wasp as the Ghost, also known as Ava. I mean, she is a knockout as an actor. She is so beautiful. But um, Ready Player One is definitely a well-cast movie with amazing special effects. And I would encourage you to see it if you haven't already. B- DVD, definitely. Blu-ray if you can. 4K if you have the money to get that <laughs> that much high definition on your TV or if you have a 4K player. But I I guess I'm speaking a little ahead of myself. Another move, The other three movies that are said to come out this week are movies I haven't seen. There's one called Incident in a Ghost Land. And not only have I not seen this, I I haven't even heard of it. And I I keep very close... I, I pay very close attention to what's coming out in theaters. Granted, I don't come from... I don't live in New York or L.A., so there are movies that I miss from time to time because of the fact that some movies open just in New York and L.A. or they open there before opening everywhere. But Incident in a Ghostland is a horror film, and it's a movie about a mother of two who inherits a home from her aunt. And on the first night in the new home, she is confronted with murderous intruders and fights for her daughter's lives. Sixteen years later, when the daughters reunite at the house things get really strange. And that's where the plot summary (laughs) kind of ends. And incidents, excuse me, the movie is called Incident in a Ghost Land. And the, the, the 
poster of the movie is delightfully creepy. It shows a woman's face that's kind of cracked like a porcelain doll. And any movie where, or any picture, let alone movie poster, where a person is staring directly at me and their face is uh, symmetrical is somehow really creepy. I can't explain it. But Incident in a Ghost Land is out on DVD and is probably available for streaming if you want to check that movie out. The other movie that is coming out in or rather on DVD is one called Operation Red Sea. And this is a movie that talks about the PLA Navy Marine Corps who launch a hostile rescue operation in Iwea and undergo a fierce battle with rebel rebellions and terrorism. This is a movie that I believe is Chinese. The director Dante Lam is Kind of a mystery. I, I guess he's Chinese. He free, blah, blah, frequently co- collaborates with director Gordon Chan. Well, it certainly has a bit of a war epic vibe to it, this movie Operation Red Sea. It is definitely a foreign film. And if you want to check it out, it is on DVD and Blu-ray today. The other movie that's coming out on... On... DVD and Blu-ray, sorry for the pause, is a movie called The Brits Are Coming. And I can't, oh, excuse me, the movie is called The Con Is On. And the, yeah, the, the, the title of, of the film, well, the, the catchphrase of the film, The Brits, is co- the Brits Are Coming, it looks that way on, on the movie poster. But The Con Is On actually has a number of well-known actors in it, including Sofia Vergara, Alice Eve, Parker Posey, and Tim Roth. And it's a movie, I think, that was only released in Great Britain. And here's the summary of the movie. In an effort to avoid paying off a massive gambling debt to a notorious mobster in England, a couple flees to Los Angeles and hatch a couple flees to Los Angeles and hatch a jewel thief theft plot. So this movie looks interesting. It certainly has a good cast. If you want to see it, it's out on DVD and Blu-ray today. Jill, why don't you tell the class what you did this weekend? Well, my dad and I went in search of some magical minnows and found a zillion of them in the stream from our lookout rock. Then my sister and I escaped from an evil slug king and went back to my super twig fort for safety. Then we told stories till it got dark and the Big Dipper led us all the way home. Whoa. Where were you, Jill? We went to the forest. It's not that far away. Ask your parents to take you and your friends to the forest this week. It's closer than you think. Check out discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies I've go- I'm going to review for this show, it's now time to get to my next segment, What's Coming Up Next. These are the movies that are coming to theaters near you, unless otherwise stated. And there are two big ones that are coming out the last weekend in July. It's hard to believe we're all- almost already through July. And... The biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this week is Mission Impossible Fallout, which is the sixth Mission Impossible movie total. Yeah, they, they've been making Mission Impossible movies, if you can believe it, for 22 years. Tom Cruise still looks great, and he's also starring in this movie. And this time, the director of the, mo- of the sixth Mission Impossible movie is Christopher McQuarrie, who is a director from New Jersey, who has actually brought us a number of films that star Tom Cruise. Uh, he, he's actually only directed four films. This is his second Uh, Mission Impossible film. He also directed the original Jack Reacher movie starring Tom Cruise. And the movie which he directed first was called The Way of the Gun, 
which came out in 2000 and starred Ryan Philippi, Benicio Del Toro, Juliette Lewis, and several other actors. I haven't seen that movie, but if it was good enough for him to eventually collaborate with Tom Cruise, then it was probably pretty good. But he he actually has written a number of films, some good, some bad. He is unfortunately responsible for the screenplay to The Mummy, which was a major misstep in Tom Cruise's um <laughs> repertoire but i think every big star makes missteps from time to time but i i guess people are willing to reg- uh, to forgive tom cruise this year given the hype surrounding mission impossible fallout but anyway tom cruise returns as ethan hunt and his imf team along with some familiar allies race against time after a mission gone wrong that's the only description i'm given here i can't tell you exactly what else goes in this movie but a number of actors from the previous films including ving rames and simon Pegg, reprise their roles in this film and it should be fun so i can't say exactly whether it'll be good or bad, but I will let you know next week when I return to do my show. Another movie that's coming out in theaters is an animated one, and it's called Teen Titans Go to the Movies. The reason I paused there after Go is because it's based on the TV show Teen Titans Go, which I guess was a little bit controversial. Some people like it, other people hate it. Maybe less controversial, more polarizing, but the movie is about a villain's maniacal plan for world domination that gets sidetracked or sidetracks five teenage superheroes who dream of Hollywood stardom. The movie has a number of celebrity voice talents in this movie. Some people like Tara Strong, who have who are not household names but still have enough um, voiceover credentials. Stan Lee is making a cameo in this film, if you can believe it. But the five teenage action heroes in question here include Robin of Batman and Robin and Cyborg, in, in addition to Raven and... Uh, th- there is Wonder Woman in this film, but I'm not sure if if she is a... Uh, a teen or not but in any event i don't know much about teen titans go there there are all these cartoons that are on cable right now like adventure time and rick and morty i hear about them all the time but given my schedule i don't have time to watch these movies but it is a bit of an advantage for me to see a movie like this which is based on a popular cartoon show because if this movie can reach me somebody who's not familiar with the show then it's probably good. But I'm definitely going to see this movie, and I will let you know what I think when I return to do next week's show. The rest of the movies on this list of what's coming up next are all movies that are coming out in limited release. And I'm trying to see if there's a a movie that might be worth your while if it's coming out in a theater near you. Um, There's one called Hot Summer Nights, which stars Timothy Chalamet, who was nominated uh, this past year for Call Me By Your Name. And it is a boy coming of age during a summer he spends in Cape Cod, which sounds kind of like Call Me By Your Name, except there's no guarantee that there is a homosexual plot in this movie. And also it takes place in Cape Cod, not Italy. But the fact that it takes place in Cape Cod, and I'm a Boston film critic, certainly has my attention. And Timothy Chalamet is a really good actor. I wasn't crazy about the movie Call Me By Your Name, but I did like Timothy Chalamet in it. But I can't guarantee it's coming out of the theater near me, so... I'm moving on and telling you that that about wraps things up with today's episode of Words on Film. I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly, and they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. So I have had an amazing time reviewing movies. There are a couple of high-profile movies that I missed, but I'm going to see them this week and review them for you for next week's show. And until then, this is your host and movie critic Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.